Hello again, it's Andrew Homer from London Brooks College and today I'm going to talk about chemical equilibrium. I've decided to break this talk up into two sections, talk about some of the basic principles of chemical equilibrium, then look at some past paper examination questions. Chemical reactions are in theory reversible. Reactants products we call going left to right, the forward reaction, and the reverse, the backward reaction. If you take, for example, something like burning a piece of magnesium, that goes all the way through to magnesium oxide, and there's, that's it, it, complete, it completes that reaction. But you could, if you heated the magnesium oxide, it would go backwards. Right, now with equilibrium, there are two aspects. There are equations which we think of as in a dynamic equilibrium, and equations which we think of as in a static equilibrium. So a model of a dynamic equilibrium, if you think of you're in a shopping centre and you're walking up an escalator, if you're walking up that escalator at the same rate as the escalator is coming down, a person viewing you from the side of the escalator, you appear to be stationary, even though there are two equal opposite processes happening simultaneously. So you're moving at the same rate up as the escalator is moving down, okay? And a lot of chemical reactions are like that, particularly gaseous ones, the very well-known harbour process, nitrogen, hydrogen making ammonia. This is in a state of dynamic dynamic equilibrium. The forward reaction and the backward reaction take place simultaneously. The position of equilibrium can be anywhere between reactants and products. It could be 90% products and 10% reactants. It could be 80% reactants and 20% products. It reaches a resting point where we say it's in a state of dynamic equilibrium. To achieve that state of dynamic equilibrium, we need to have a constant temperature and pressure. As soon as you start changing the conditions, then you shift the position of equilibrium. More about that in a moment. Also, this has to happen in what we call a closed system. A closed system is where material can't move in and out. A system that's in a dynamic equilibrium will reach a resting point. For example, this uh, harbour process reaction here, it might be 80% products and 20% reactants. It might be 30% reactants and 70% products. It reaches a resting point where the forward and the backward reaction are happening simultaneously and there is no net change in the concentration of reactants and products. To achieve that we need conditions of constant temperature and pressure. Also we need the materials to be in what's called a closed environment. So that means materials can't enter or leave that system. When, we, when we've got those factors in place we can achieve a, a state of dynamic equilibrium. A bit like the person walking up the down escalator. Nothing seems to be happening even though at a molecular level we've got the forward reaction happening at the same time as the backward reaction happening. I've got two examples here. These are contrasting because they've got different enthalpy changes. I want to say a quick word about this. Question that catches students out. When I say delta H equals minus 92 kilojoules per mole, they will recognize that the minus 92 means exothermic. That means a reaction that gets hot. And that refers to the forward reaction. That is exo there. It gives out 92 kilojoules of energy. And then the backward reaction is a cooling down endothermic reaction. But when I ask kilojoules per mole, per mole of what? And this always catches students out. When I say per mole, they become a bit unsure. The per mole means per mole of reaction, as it's written. So mole of nitrogen, three moles of hydrogen, two moles of ammonia. The value given, the enthalpy change, refers to the equation as written. Okay, so the forward reaction, this negative means the forward reaction is exothermic. This second reaction here has uh, an endothermic forward reaction. So when we move from left to right, it is a cooling down reaction. And the reverse process is exactly the same energy, but it gives out heat. So this one is plus 206 kilojoules per mole. So for a mole of the chemical equation as written, it takes in 206 kilojoules of energy. Just a bit of more detailed chemistry. The very well-known harbour process to make ammonia to make fertilisers. If you ask students where do we get the hydrogen from, it's not in the atmosphere. Hydrogen is such a low density, fast moving molecule, it diffuses out into space. We get the hydrogen from this reaction here, which is called steam reforming. Methane, natural gas, reacting with steam and a catalyst produces hydrogen, which is used in that reaction there. But that, that's, that's a bit of a detail. So I've got the 
sense about dynamic equilibrium, let me just, in passing, talking about, talk about a static equilibrium. If you imagine people sitting on a seesaw, you could have a heavier person this end and a lighter person. It comes to a resting point. Now, it's not dynamic because there's no processes happening, you know, that you can't see. It's completely, utterly stationary. So that position of equilibrium, just like here, could be anywhere on that seesaw, okay? But it comes to a resting point. Now, if you burn a piece of magnesium, you get magnesium oxide, and that is a static equilibrium. You don't have a backward reaction happening at the same time. Next section, I want to talk about what happens if we start to change the conditions in this reaction. This ammonia reaction here, harbour process, if you heat that system up, the system that has got those materials in it, heating it up always favours the cooling down direction. So question to the class is, if you heat that system up, which way will the equilibrium move? The forward reaction is exothermic, back is endothermic. So if you heat the system up, it will move in the which direction? It'll move to the left in the cooling down direction. It'll move that way there. And so, you know, if you've got 80% products, it will move that way and you might only have 60% products. Okay, so it moves in the cooling down direction if you heat that reaction up. Looking at this reaction here, if you heated that system up, the system with all those materials in, heating it up favours the endothermic cooling down direction. So if I heat that dynamic equilibrium up, which way does the position of equilibrium shift? It shifts in the cooling down endothermic direction, which in this case is to the right. So I get more products and less reactants. So that's the effect of temperature. We can manipulate the position of equilibrium. This is vital in industrial chemistry because in industry, we're trying to manipulate reactions to produce products. The better the yield, the better the profit. There's also another aspect as well. If I change the volume of the system, so imagine the chemicals are in a box, nitrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen ammonia, if you increase the pressure of that system, if you increase the pressure, the system moves to try to reduce the pressure. So if you look at that equation logically, which way to the right or the left, if you increase the pressure, which way do you think reduces the pressure? The side which has less molecules will have less pressure. It will move to the side with less molecules. So if you increase the pressure, imagine that's like um, you know, a box and we stand on it and we squash it down it will move to the side with less molecules. In other words, it moves to the right-hand side because there are four molecules there and two there. So by reducing the number of molecules, it's reduced the pressure. If we look at this system here, if we increase the pressure on that system there, which way is it going to move? Remember we said it will move to the side that will try to reduce the pressure. So in this reaction here, it can reduce the pressure by moving to the left. It will move to the left that way because here we've got four molecules and over here we've got two. So we're able to manipulate the position of equilibrium. It's quite flexible, the position of equilibrium, by changing the temperature and the pressure. A couple of little footnotes here. Do catalysts affect the position of equilibrium? Absolutely not. All a catalyst does is get you there quicker. So if you think of a bus journey, a catalyst just gets you there quickly. It just speeds up the journey. It doesn't change the destination. It just gets you there more quickly. But something else I wanted to add before I move off this. I said that increasing the temperature in, a, in example one, increasing the temperature pushes the equilibrium to the left. It favors the endothermic reaction. A question that catches students out, if you're asked what effect does increasing the temperature have on the rate of the reaction? What effect does the temperature have on, have on the rate of the reaction? In this example here, students kind of think, oh, it's going to the left, it's making it slower. Absolutely, totally wrong. Increasing the temperature always, 100% always, increases the rate. So increasing the temperature shifts it to the left, it just does it more quickly. Whichever way it's going, it shifts it more quickly by increasing the temperature. So don't make that mistake that increasing the temperature slows a reaction down just because it's going to the left-hand side. Okay, so those are the 
uh, preliminaries of equilibrium. When we look at uh, examples of dynamic equi equilibrium equations in the gas phase, there is a strict relationship between the products and the reactants, and it's what we call equilibrium constants. If you look at this PCl3, PCl5, and Cl2, if we use concentration units, there's what we call the equilibrium constant Kc, and it's always products over reactants, so it's the concentration of PCl3 times the concentration of chlorine divided by the concentration of PCl5. Products over reactants. Square brackets means concentration. Concentration of. We can also write that using partial pressures. Partial pressures, partial pressure is the is the pressure a gas would have if it occupied the volume alone without any other gases there. You can work out partial pressure from the total pressure multiplied by the mole fraction of that gas. That will come up in the past paper questions. So to write an equilibrium constant using partial pressures, we call it Kp, and the partial pressure will be the partial pressure of the products, PCl3 gas, times the partial pressure of chlorine gas, divided by partial pressure of PCl5 gas. So P is partial pressure. Okay, students are required to put units for these in their, when they've worked out what Kc or Kp is. If you look at this, we've got square brackets square, uh, times square brackets divided by square brackets. So effectively, square brackets cancel out. So concentration units here are moles a decimeter cubed. Partial pressure is measured in atmospheres. So we've got atmospheres squared on the top divided by atmospheres. So effectively those two units cancel out and so the units there are atmospheres. Look at another example here and if you wanted to pause the video you could decide what you think the Kc expression is. Kc is using concentration units, so concentration of the methanol in this example, gas, divided by the reactants, carbon monoxide, times H2 squared. That becomes squared in the equation there. I'll look at the units in a moment, and then the using partial pressures, Kp will be the partial pressure of the methanol gas, divided by the partial pressure of the carbon monoxide, multiplied by the partial pressure of the hydrogen squared. So you're expected to be able to set these up. You should only use square brackets when you're talking about concentration units, and you only use square brackets with Kc. A blunder students make is to use the square brackets when they're setting up a Kp expression. Square brackets with Kc, partial pressures with Kp. Okay, if you look at this here, we've got concentration units on the top and it can cancel with those. Effectively, we've got one over concentration units squared on the bottom. We've got that down there. It's one divided by moles squared dm to the minus six. Reciprocal of those units becomes moles minus two dm plus six. So those are the units there. Sometimes convention that you put the parameter with a positive number first, dm6 moles to the minus two. So that's the units of Kc there. Here, we've got atmospheres cancelling out with atmospheres there. So it's one over atmospheres squared, which equals atm to the minus two. If we just look at this one down here, this is interesting because I've got equal numbers of moles, equal numbers of molecules on both sides. So the Kc expression there, Kc equals, again, Again, products, concentration of NO squared, that two becomes a squared in the equation, and then concentration of N2 gas times the concentration of O2 gas. While I'm talking about this one over here, you might like to think of what the units are for that Kc there. And so in terms of partial pressures, Kp, it's the partial pressure of NO gas squared. The squared becomes, because of the number in the equation there, has to become squared. And then partial pressure of N2 gas times the partial pressure of O2 gas. Given any equation, you'd be expected to set up a Kc expression involving moles per decimeter cubed or Kp involving atmospheres. Very, very simple answer to the question, what are the units here? We've got concentration units squared over concentration units squared, so the units top and bottom are cancelling out, so no units. Okay, similarly over here, ATM squared over ATM squared, so again no units. So when you've got equimolar equations,
equations, equal moles on both sides, there are no units. That can help you quite a bit in some of the examination questions. You don't have to worry about that. Right, one more example, because um, it makes a particular point we haven't met before. So decomposition of calcium carbonate, limestone. Calcium carbonate solid decomposes into quicklime, calcium oxide, plus CO2. Solid, solid gas. All the examples I've just talked about so far have all been purely gaseous equilibria. This is what we call a heterogeneous equilibrium, heterogeneous, that we've got two different states or two different phases is the proper term for it. Simple rule here, you just imagine that the solid isn't there. Just delete that when you write your KC expression. So KC, as before, products over reactants, so ignore the solid calcium oxide, it's just the concentration of the CO2 gas by itself. If you think about it, the concentration of a solid in itself doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's actually the density of the material. It's not what we're concerned with here. So I've just ignored that and ignored the solid calcium carbonate there. Equilibrium constant using partial pressures. Again, only the gas is equilibrium because we're talking about partial pressures of the CO2 only. And so it's just the partial pressure of CO2 gas. So coming to units, square brackets, moles per decimeter cubed and units here are ATM atmospheres. Okay, now just a quick final quick note on that. You could write the reaction the other way round. There's no reason why you can't just rotate it and just have these as reactants over here and then calcium carbonate over there. If you did that, then your KC would be one divided by concentration of CO2 and one divided by partial pressure of uh, carbon dioxide. Okay, so that's the preliminaries. I'm gonna look at a few past paper questions. Thank you. Thank you.